Hey guys, it's Dustin Golly back here from DG's Pro Tech with another episode of DG TV. You know, we love getting these information, informational videos off to you. We haven't done them for a while. Today we thought we'd hit on something that we've seen a lot of in the shop lately. Get all you guys out there as much information as we possibly can about GM and specifically the Gen 4 engine platform. It's trials, it's tribulations, just like our other brands that we pick on. We're going to pick on this one today too at DG's Pro Tech. Okay, so we always like to start off with the history because knowing what's behind you to knowing the technology in front of you helps anybody that's trying to diagnose or, or just know what they're dealing with. In around 98, 99, GM uh, specifically introduced a new line of engines to replace their small block and V6, V6 counterparts. And I'm sure you guys know this was called the VTEC series of, or sorry, Vortex series of engines. It consisted of basically five engines. You had your 4.3 V6, you had your 4.8, you had your 5.3 and your 6 liter V8s, small block V8s, and then you had your big boy, your 8.1 big block V8. They were all kind of based off the same technology and platform, okay? Um, they worked really well for the day. They ranged, or at least the small block V8s ranged in horsepower somewhere between the 270 and the 310 horsepower, depending on make, model, year, and specifically its application. And these were used in tons of GM applications. We're talking, you know, some of the bigger cars, SUVs, definitely within the pickup trucks, well, you know, across the whole line, this, this engine was, did very well. It was really reliable, simple technology, easy to work on and life was good. Let's fast forward to our 2007 to 14 and specifically I'm talking pickup generations here um, and the engines and their technologies that carried forward. Get into those newer technologies. We were able to push that horsepower specifically of again, our 4.8, 6 liter, even up into the 6.2 small blocks. Basically the 5.3 being the engine we're gonna talk about today more specifically, would have been living around the 315 horsepower at that time. Then we fast forward to 2014 model year and up into about the 2017, 18 model year. Specifically, they changed that basic engine technology, keeping the same basic block patterns, but again, they needed to compete on the higher stage with the other counterparts out there that had upped the ante for their technology in their pickups. You gotta remember around that time, you see a lot more consumers driving pickup trucks and what do consumers demand? Well, they demand reliability and now more importantly, economy. So GM made some changes we're gonna show you here in a second. Specifically, let's talk fuel system because it was simple. In following with Ford and their EcoBoost platform, they saw the need to go to high pressure direct injection gasoline technology. Now this is just standard naturally aspirated, but they're running a high pressure direct injection pump, which I'll show you in a second, that is in the valley directly off the camshaft lobe, pumping up and down, running and upwards of give or take 2000 PSI at max pressure. Beauty of that is it's going directly into the cylinder. What does that get us? Like you've heard me say before, if we can at bring that fuel pressure up and atomize it finer, we can get more power out of the same liter of fuel, hypothetically speaking. Now, in 2014 model year, we saw the engine lineup change a little bit and they called this or they dubbed this, there's a couple different L series of it, but if you call it the L series to stay with me for all generations, and Ecotech specifically. So this is your V6 and V8 Ecotech platform you see here. The 4.3 V6 stuck around, it got its direct injection. The 4.8 V8 was gone, there was no real need for it. Uh, and the 5.3 and 6.2 were the two other small block V8s that were on the block running this technology. Now we're not gonna step too deep into talking about the direct injection technology because this episode is all about GM's active fuel management its problems with the reliability that goes with it, but basically it's operation. We're gonna teach you about a little bit here because that's what we're working on today. All right, so GM's calling this new technology, and again, we're generation four, we're gonna call this for basics, but they're calling this AFM. AFM has been around now since model year 14, and it stands for active fuel management. Well, what does that mean? Well, the active fuel management system more or less simply shuts down four of the cylinders in a V8 engine, allowing you to run in a four cylinder mode so that we use less fuel. Now this only works in light load applications. Obviously, if you put your foot down on that right throttle pedal and you gotta go, we're gonna give you V8. Come cruising on the highway when four cylinders will do, shut off four cylinders. Now, how are we gonna do this? It's gonna be balanced. Engineers had that challenge. 
by actually using in the Gen 4 specifically only four specific cylinders. And in this case, they are number one, number four, number six, and number seven. Why those cylinders? Well, because they balance each other within the firing order so that the engine is simply running smooth when in four cylinder mode. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, a few things happen simultaneously. The engine control system is going to shut off oil to those four specific cylinders and their intake and exhaust lifters. By having oil actually shoot through, and I'm gonna show you some parts here in a second, a solenoid to actually move a plunger, collapse a lifter. Now, as the camshaft rotates, it's not going to rock the, or push the push rod, rock the rocker, and then therefore with no valves opening, you create more or less an air pump in four cylinders. Need to jump it back to V8 mode because the driver's just stepped on his throttle? Well, easy, we just let that oil plunger release by hitting it with some oil pressure, lifter pumps back up, simultaneously push rod and rocker start to rock, valves start to open. Now the computer's also gonna shut off the fuel and spark to that corresponding cylinder. We wouldn't wanna wash the cylinder or have this unwanted spark in those cylinders. And that's pretty seamless with the technology GM put into this. Other brands are doing it as well. Other names, this AFM and GM land, you might call it MDS or multi-displacement system in a Chrysler product. Uh, you might call this DOD or displacement on demand in other generations and the European and Japanese counterparts have their own name for it as well. This is not a new idea. It just had to be put in a place so that it would be reliable enough that it's going to last the long haul for the demands of the average North American customer and maybe even worldwide. Most of you guys watching these videos and, and commenting on them, which by the way, keep doing that, subscribe to our stuff. You're gonna love what you keep seeing, like the technical side of it, I'm gonna show you under the hood. So specifically under the hood, we obviously have one cylinder head off in this case for this repair on this 2015 model year. You see one bank of lifters installed and one bank of lifters uninstalled. I'm gonna show you the differences on the bench in a second. This is our oil control manifold for, for lack of a better term. And I'll show you the old one on the bench in a second and how that works. Basically we have a sensor and a control solenoid in here that's going to dump oil pressure to two cylinders here two cylinders on the other side, specifically again, allowing those cylinders to produce nothing, but still the piston rotates up and down on the crankshaft in its regular rotation. Holding in my left hand here, I have the high fuel pump specifically, just to show you guys, again, in 2014, this began, you see a high pressure fuel rail, just like a diesel has. These high pressure fuel pump itself actually fits into that cavity in the back and having a camshaft running a plunger on it, very similar to the EcoBoost platform that Ford has and how that works. Now, we've obviously just had to simply remove that to disable to get this oil manifold because that's its mounting location. It's gonna run high pressure to, in this case, the left side and the right side rail on the engine and the high pressure injectors that that feeds the fuel system to. We're not talking again so much fuel system. Neatly enough, in GM's configuration, they're using the front and back cylinder on this bank and the two center cylinders on the other bank. And again, if you can picture the piston here coming up and down, but instead having no valves that would physically open, so they're gonna sit here at rest, piston can go up and down all day long. Now again, no air in, no exhaust out, really means that cylinder has no purpose during those times. Now, there are concerns with this. Remember, maintenance is key here. If we don't have clean, proper viscosity, uh, proper good filtration of oils in this oil system. Can you just imagine the solenoid or the, the solenoid that has to control that coming up with problems or the lifter that has to actually plunge and then stay unplunged and actually having that over the long haul, this is where the problems come into. Now, not all of these are simply caused by maintenance uh, issues. Some of them are just Again, you have complicated technology and with complicated technology, you're gonna potentially have some drivability issues. That is the name of the game in modern technology. So we'll show you some more stuff on the bench here and, uh, and kind of go from there. So over here at the bench, we're gonna show you some of the crucial components now out of the vehicle so you can kind of understand how they work. Remember, with our active fuel management, we are wanting to dump oil to the lifter. Now here's an active fuel management lifter compared to a non-active fuel management lifter out of the same engine. Remember, we're gonna have two of these in the cylinders that have this ability to shut down, and we're gonna have two of these standard ones, again, on just a standard hydraulic roller lifter, running against that camshaft in the cylinders that do not have the ability to shut down. I'll show you the failed component in this vehicle, just to give you a comparison. There's your failed lifter. Now, this one happened to be on cylinder number seven compared to a non-failed lifter. So as you can see, the plunge is quite different on that. So if you can picture, this is rolling against the camshaft. This is pushing against our push rod, okay? 
And if you can picture this going up and down, remember this has to be pumped up as seen here to have full extent to up and down and rock on our rocker, which is going to then open and close the intake and exhaust valves. Now, if the lifter has collapsed or failed internally, obviously this can go up and down all day long, but we're gonna sit there and rub on our push rod and the push rod itself is not gonna have enough extension to actually rock our rocker and nothing happens. So this is your failed component here. Now, one thing we wanna watch for specifically in this, and we did find it in this engine, I'll try and show you the application of it. There's actually quite a bit of excessive wear, it's hard to see there in the shot, or uneven wear on the tip of that push rod, okay? Also the corresponding rocker then where this sits into its actual push rod bucket. Again, rough areas there, it's gonna need some push rod and rocker work in that case. Um, this is showing now, again, if you simply look at a, a roller lifter setup as it's to be installed in one of the core quadrants of the engine, you can see where oil is fed into these. Now, these are all sitting at the same length because these would ride, I can do so tipping, physically against the actual camshaft. So these are gonna ride up and down like that. Notice, there's my brand new AFM units going back to be installed and they only fit one way beautifully by GM to the cylinder next to them, which is just a standard hydraulic roller lifter. Again, still has oil that's fed up into them and through, seen there. But regardless, you can see with our failed and then non-failed components kind of comparison. Now, specifically, we're not gonna go into this engine and we're only gonna replace the failed lifter. Things were built on the same day. Chances I've got the same amount of rotations on them if they're inside an engine, obviously. The rate of failure might happen quicker on that. So a, a, to be re prepared correctly here, we're gonna use GM OEM parts and we're gonna make sure that we're replacing all of them on that series of scenarios. The other big thing that a lot of guys say to see, this is what we call our LOMA or our lifter oil manifold assembly. Okay, this was the same part I showed you in the vehicle. You can see our sensor, our electrical control going through and notice here we have one, two, three, four, two center, to front and rear opposing. And this is where the actual oil will come in and be redirected away from the lifter or to the lifter. So basically if you can picture this into the four cylinder mode, we're gonna power up one, two, three, four solenoids. They're gonna open and close depending on what we tell them to do. Redirect oil away or to the actual lifter to get it in four cylinder mode and V8 mode. And it happens quite seamlessly. Problems that can then happen is either an electrical failure within the solenoid, a hydraulic failure within the actual Loma itself, or in the actual solenoid valve body assembly. Very similar to a transmissions valve body in a transmission application. We're just using it with hydraulic lube oil technology here. Uh, other interesting things, again, show, like showing these parts apart, that is your oil rail out of the vehicle. These are high pressure Teflon seals that must be replaced and sized with special service tools, one-time use, uh, high pressure injector to rail connectors and very tight tolerances on this stuff. And then of course a high pressure rail sensor, just like we'd see in diesel applications. Remember, if one OEM is gonna push that technology to the next boundary, you're gonna find that the others are gonna follow suit if the technology does work, and this does work. Chrysler and GM being the two domestics that use it quite commonly, both have similar failure rates in them. So you're talking the Hemi counterpart to the 5.3 here. However, that application typically in these engines is only in Val or, uh, in valve or overhead valve uh, type scenario to engine, in block cams. We're not seeing this in overhead cam engines, specifically in domestic engines yet, but we'll get to that specifically. Now, this is Gen If we do jump up to the Gen 5 starting in 2019, they actually have gone further with this technology in now that all of the lifters have the ability to collapse and extend like this, and actually the ECM can control it to all eight cylinders, doing it in a pattern specifically so we don't see excessive wear on one cylinder or the other. Next step of technology creates its own problems. There are multiple TSBs on the fourth gen. Again, the fourth gen being 14 to 18 in the GM pickup applications. And we do see failures in all four years. I'm not saying yours is gonna fail. I'm just saying maintenance is key here. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Or when it's time for repair, the pros at, at a shop here like DG's ProTech can help you out to get you fixed up for the least amount possible and back on the road. It's really all I have to say about this system. Um, as a footnote, and there's a, maybe do a separate video about this, for racing application customers that wanna have small block engine assemblies to disable said system, there's two forms to do it. You can disable electronically, obviously having the computer not shut off for Loma, and then they're obviously going to a non um, Loma style lifter within the system. But again, that's only for racing applications uh, or off-road use in that way. You can contact us to talk about that further if need be. Beautiful technology. We love what GM does with these stuff. Lots of good stuff to see, lots of good repairs to make. 
pros to DG's ProTech here in Listful because you're going to come in, it's going to be diagnosed accurately, it's going to be fixed right, and you're going to be back in the road as quick as possible. So from all of our team here at DG's TV, uh, DG's ProTech, keep following, keep tagging, keep sharing, subscribe to these. These are great videos. We love putting them out for you guys to get you the information so you're an informed customer because an informed customer is always a happy customer. Thanks, guys.